everyone, I'm James Milan, and this is the ABCs of LGBTQ+, our series that looks at a lot of the um, most essential aspects of uh, life in and for the LGBTQ+, community. Uh, today, I am joined by Carmen Paulino and Tracy McKay, and I'm going to ask the two of you, uh, first of all, thanks for being here, obviously. Um, but I want to ask you to just introduce yourselves, please. Well, I'll start out. Uh, thanks for having us. Thanks for doing this series. It's wonderful. Again, my name is Tracy McKay. I use she, her pronouns, and I am the program manager for Greater Boston PFLAG. And I am also the mom of three children, two of whom are transgender. And Carmen. Um, hi, um, my name is Carmen Paulino, and I use pronoun of she and hers. Um, James, thank you for having us. Um, I am also a parent of five children, three who identify as transgender and two who are my foster children. All right. Well, I think um, you out there in the audience, I think, understand why uh, we would have invited and then uh, Tracy and Carmen to join us for this conversation, which is essentially um, about how families uh, can support, um, particularly children, but any members uh, of the family, really, how that family unit can be a source of support for those who are, uh, who are uh, self-identifying within the LGBTQ plus community. So um, to begin with, um, you know, it, it may seem obvious to some people, but I'd, I'd, I'd love to just uh, have you tackle the basic question of why is it so important uh, that a child who is LGBTQ be supported uh, within, the, within the home? Sure. Well, you know, as you said, it, it does seem that, that, that it should be very obvious, right? We all want to support our kids. But particularly when you think about LGBTQ youth, what we know is that they are much higher risk for anxiety, depression, suicidality. Um, but what we also know, and the good news, is that when families are supportive and affirming, those numbers change dramatically. Uh, I think of one particular report by the Trevor Project that was done, I believe, in 2018 that said that kids who were supported by just one, even one accepting adult, were 40% less likely to be suicidal. So it's um, certainly very important uh, for their long-term mental health and for your relationship to be uh, supporting when they, when they do come out to you. And while, you know, uh, you, you guys are not necessarily social scientists or anything, I'm not asking for very, you know, specific data about this, but in general, from what you understand, um, you know, what is the kind of proportion or percentage of, of, of children who have to deal with um, unsupportive environments from the adults around them versus those who are, you know, can count on at least one of those adults uh, being supportive? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know that I know the statistics on that. Carmen, is that something? Yeah, and again, not. Uh, yeah. I understand statistics, you know, are are not necessarily, you know, readily uh, at hand, but just kind of your sense of, you know, uh, is, is in general, uh, are most kids in this situation in relatively supportive environments or not? So my experience has been that um, the answer to that is no, there's a lot of children who don't have affirming homes and affirming um, families. Um, and that's why one of the reasons why it's so important that a child has at least that one person um, in at home, at school, or um, throughout their local communities. Um, children have proven that they are very successful and can live productive and happy lives when they do have that in their lives. Um, and you know, to to start to start to dig into the nitty gritty a little bit more here. Um, both of you have transgender children and I'm wondering um, at, at what point or, or how, how did the coming out process around that um, happen for your, I know you each have multiple children, uh, so the stories might be different with different ones, um, but just give us a sense of, of, how, of, of how that happened. Did it come from your child? Did it come from you recognizing something? How did that go? 
I can take the lead on that question mm -hmm. right now. Um, so my son, um, Ashton, came out um, as transgender when he was 12 years old and in the seventh grade. Um, and he came out um, to me. Um, I believe that he also, um, in the same week, um, shared that with a gym teacher um, who is also part of um, the LGBT community in his school. Um, I can say that, you know, my biggest, um, my biggest um, expectation for myself was that I told him repetitively that I love them, um, that I accept them for who he is, that we were in this together, um, and that nothing changes who he is as my child, who I love very much. Um, and on a side note to that, I also have two other children who are transgender and they are both foster children and they've been with us for a year. Um, and what I have learned as a foster parent is that when my kids walk into my home, and I say that specifically because I specialize in transgender youth um, in the foster care, 50% um, of my battle is out the door by me making them feel firm, welcome in my home, and using proper pronouns. Mm -hmm. So that has been um, my experience, per se. Um, and what I could say is that though you're supportive at home, you know, there's other factors that you have to consider, you know, school, friends, family members, church community, right? So when my son came out, um, he had a lot of heaviness on his chest um, in the sense that, yes, I was loving and supportive at home, um, but he needed to figure out how he was going to navigate um, all the other communities and his longtime friends and all of that. And that could be very stressful for a child. Um, and we are lucky enough um, to have a supportive community and loving family members who are very accepting, but that's not the case for a lot of children, which is one of the reasons why, you know, I opened my home to children in foster care. Yeah, and I do want to um, to hear also, obviously, what, what, what your experience has been, Tracy, but just to follow up for a second, Kahneman, on what you were saying, um, I'm not sure if people are aware that, of course, uh, trans children are being are in the foster care system just as much, you know, as, as they are represented in the larger population, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. And I would imagine that that is, uh, you know, that that compounds the difficulty mm -hmm. a lot of the time for that child in navigating the foster care system is that who knows how much uh, uh, attention is being paid to identifying parents such as yourself um, who create uh, the right kinds of environment in those homes. Um, do you have, a, you, you were saying that you have a kind of, you specialize is I think the way that you put it. Um, how did that even happen? Was, was somebody, mm -hmm. did somebody seek you out looking for a supportive environment for, for trans foster children? Or did you mm -hmm. present yourself? How, how did that mm -hmm. go? So I would share that um, our journey was not always a smooth one. Um, our path, you know, we're finally in that place where, you know, um, we have built community and we are aware of resources and we're very much involved. Um, but in the beginning, as a family, as we tried to navigate things, um, it was hard. Um, especially in living in a community of color, right? Where um, still there's um, a lot of bias um, and a lot of education needs to happen around being transgender. Um, and I just learned that it was a very difficult um, thing to navigate. Um, and I learned that there was a lot of homeless youth, um, a lot of youth of color also, um, for various reasons, right? Um, where they come from, um, religious beliefs, um, community beliefs. Um, and it was very difficult for a lot of families to come to peace with that and understand. Um, so to me, um, as I supported my son through his transition, it was very important that I educated my community, that um, I was able to portray a mother's love 
for their child unconditionally. And the fact that that is our responsibility as parents is to love and accept our children no matter their gender, no, man, no matter their sexuality. Um, and that every child can be successful. Every child can be, um, grow to be a good person if they have a loving environment. So I did research and I connected with a foster care agency um, that is a therapeutic agency. Um, and I told them that I specifically wanted to um, foster transgender youth because not only it was it important to me to foster love and attention and, you know, um, the medical and mental health support that that child needs to be successful, but I wanted to be able to connect with families, with their families, to, you know, help them and meet them where they're at, because that's super important, to meet parents where they are and validate all those feel feelings and all those fears, because they're very real. I, you know, I've always been concerned, and I continue to be concerned for the safety of my child, but I know that um, he's going to be a healthier and happier adult with my love and my support. So I wanted to be able to connect with those families um, as they work through reunification and educate them and just, you know, listen and um, let them know that they're not alone and that they certainly don't have to do this alone, that we can do this together. Well, you, I got to say, it sounds like you are quite the res the resource, um, perhaps even a treasure, uh, as far as those families and those children are concerned. So that's a that's a wonderful perspective to to hear. Um, and, and Tracy, though, I, I I also would be interested to hear what what has happened in in your home. Sure, and I, I just want to <clears throat> reiterate that um, you know Carmen's work is even, or her mission or commitment is even more important because. LGBTQ youth are actually over, highly overrepresented in the foster care system because of family rejection. So um, they're much, it's a much higher pop, um, percentage of the foster care population. So, um, so for myself, my oldest child uh, came out in a kind of um, roundabout way. She, it was about 17 or 16 or 17. And, you know, it wasn't really clear what was going on. Uh, it took a while to get to the point where she was um, able to um, understand herself and, and come out to us and say, you know, that I'm trans and this is, this is what it is. So during the point where we were working uh, with, working through this with her, and again, like Carmen, you know, my first instinct was, um, you know, no matter what is going on, I love you and I support you and we will do whatever you need to do. It was surprising. Neither of my kids gave me any indication that this is where we were headed when they were younger. But so it was surprising and I had to do a lot of education. But, you know, the first thing I wanted her to know was that we were, my husband and I were behind her. So um, as we were working this out with her um, and we hadn't really shared anything with anybody because she wasn't ready for that. My youngest, chi youngest child, who was 11 at the time, uh, she was much more clear cut. She let me know. She came out to me one day and said, um, you know, I'll never forget her. She wrote it down. I'm having questions about my gender. Um, so neither of them knew about the other, which is kind of wild. But, wow. Um, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Neither of them knew about the other. So there was this time period that where my, my husband and I were supporting both of them and holding kind of all of this <laughs> without anyone else knowing. But, um, that, but then, I you mean, know, that's, that's, that, that's, <laughs> that's just kind of in, you know, intriguing is a weird word to use, but um, it, 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 was it, was it uh, because you were respecting uh, each of your child's, um, it, it, you were respecting their desires in terms of keep holding it just, just among you, not even sharing it with, with the other child? Exactly. And I think that that's one of the, you know, one of the important points, um, is that you know you have to re respect your child's desire for uh, and need for privacy um at, at even any... within the family which i think is a really important point for yes. people to understand even within the family they neither of them the right away were ready for us to share that with um, with their siblings or with um you know the larger family so we waited and like i said my husband and i kind of held that all and waited until they were ready and when you know my oldest daughter was ready first 
Um, and then she told, uh, the, you know, our immediate family and then kind of went out from there. And then when my youngest child was ready, then she was able to do that as well. But we felt it was really important. You know, I, I think for any child that comes out to you, I think it's really important to let them lead the way. Um, it has to be their process. And some kids, I think, are ready to, to you know, they've been thinking about this for a long, long time. Um, many of them, many of them thinking about it for a long time. And as a parent, it's hard because you're just hearing about it. <laughs> but they've been thinking about it for a while and, and are ready to go. So some kids will want to move. I'm sorry to, to interrupt. Okay. Would you say that that holds true, that it, you really need mm -hmm. to have, have the child uh, lead the process, um, irrespective of, of the age, of their age? Um, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you know, you needs to be discussions about, you know, who they want to tell and how they want to tell them and when they're ready. So I think that that goes true, whether it's parents, whether it's schools, I do a lot of trainings at schools. And, um, and we have to tell teachers that if a child comes out to you, um, and they're not ready to tell other people, you have to be the one to hold that um, you can't, you know, out that child to other people, it has to be uh, led by the child. So I would say yes. Um, regardless of the age that child is needs to be in control of that information. Well, let me ask both of you uh, a question that's kind of um, about strategy in a sense, um, by which, so let me be clear, both of you have indicated what your, what your initial reactions were when you first heard from your children uh, about this. And in both of your cases, what you said to them is what you felt in your hearts, which is, and feel, and feel, which is nothing uh, that, none, nothing that you tell me is going to change the fact um, that I love you unconditionally, et cetera. So my question is, in terms of strategies, for a parent who doesn't feel that way um, when they hear that, um, would you counsel that it, it is still best to give that message um, as the initial message um, or, 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 or what? How about it if, it, you know, what would you say to parents who don't, mm -hmm. don't have that reaction? Um, James, I would, I would think that it is important for the parent to validate their own feelings. Um, that doesn't mean that you can be supportive and loving. I think that my, my recommendation would be to acknowledge that you heard what the message was. Hey, this is who I am, mom or dad. Um, and for you to say, thank you for letting me know. Mm -hmm. Like, it doesn't have to be a big conversation. Um, you know, I think that that, per <clears throat> that child just needs some time to take a deep breath at that moment anyways and just feel good that it's out there that they were able to say it and if you're having a difficult time processing if you don't know if this is something that you um understand or you even believe in i think that as a parent my recommendation to you would be to acknowledge to acknowledge and, and remind your child that you love them in that moment. You don't have to have a huge conversation about what the next steps are or anything like that. Your child will let you know when that time is and when the next step is, you know? Um, so I would say, be true to yourself, um, take a deep breath, you know, and just reassure your child that you heard that, you know, you're not ignoring. Um, and I think that taking things one step at a time is the best approach. And like that, like um, you can have meaningful conversations, right? Um, you don't have to be reactive and think exactly, you know, what do I have to say? You know, what do I have to do? But you can, you can use words or phrases as tell me more, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. um, what does this mean? Educate yourself, go on Google. You know, I did that. I had to do that. I still have to do that. Mm -hmm. This is a journey for a parent as well as for your child. Um, I don't have all the answers. So I don't expect any parent to have all the answers. And I think that your children will appreciate if you tell them just that, mm -hmm. that you don't have all the answers, but that you're willing to learn and you're willing to educate yourself and to hear them out. I think that 
that that is the best thing that you can do for yourself so that you can keep it honest with yourself and feel good about the process and what you're doing as well as showing your love and support for your child. Yeah, I think it's important to be genuine. I think kids know when you're not being genuine. So to really in that moment, think of something that is true. And for most parents, that is, I love you and I want the best for you. And, you know, you may have all kinds of fears in your head. You probably do about what this means. Uh, you know, you want your best for your child and you're not sure that, you know, you can have that with this new information. But just finding that, that true peace that's in there, that I support you and I love you. Um, and then as Carmen said, take a breath and, um, you know, kind of process that. One of the things that I think is so important for parents that um, whether you're struggling with it because of, you know, religious reasons, political reasons, cultural reasons, or whether it's just new information, it's so important to, you know, you have these feelings of maybe fear and confusion and what have you. It's so important to deal with those feelings outside of your interactions with your child, right? Um, those, uh, those feelings are absolutely appropriate and valid, but that's not something that you want to work out with your child. Your child's got your, their own stuff going on. You know, there's support groups, therapists, friends. Um, it's important to acknowledge those and find a place to work those out, but not do that with your child. Mm -hmm. um, you both have addressed this already to some degree, but um, I, I wanted to ask what uh, in your uh, minds and in your experience, what does active support for a child, um, again, af especially after the initial stages of first hearing and then processing and beginning to put things in place, what does active support for a child look like? Um, what are the components that are, that are vital to that um, as, you know, the, as the weeks become months become years? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, again, assuming that your child is still within your home and um, where you're still part of the main support system for him or her. Or sure. I think that that, you know, that, that, active, that word active is really important because while, it, while the first, your first thing has to be, um, I love you and I support you. Like if it ends there, then that's, that's not enough, right? So things like making sure you use the new name and the pronoun. Uh, asking your child, like, what do you need from me? For, for a transgender child, that may mean, you know, taking them shopping for new clothes. Um, those are some things. Connecting them with other folks in the community, whether it's finding a, a transgender mentor, an LGBTQ mentor for your child, an adult, or, um, you know, support group, like seeking out those resources for your child and, and being a child's advocate, whether that is at the doctor's office, um, school, um, in a religious community, really being out there as an advocate for your child, um, demanding that respect for your child are all ways to really actively show your support. Mm -hmm. I'm sure, Carmen, you've got some more. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, James, I would add to that, um, that what active looks like in different communities, right? I think that when we're more Americanized, we're more open to counseling, um, we're more opening, we're more open to, you know, reaching out to different communities like our church, if we think that that's a support system. Um, but sometimes culturally, um, that's not just what we're taught to do, you know? Um, and when that happens, I would say, you know, ask your child. So, you know, what is the next step? And some people know about pronouns. Some people know about preferred names. No one in my family or culture had ever even heard of that. Okay, so they're like, what do you mean pronoun? What do you mean a name, you know? So it's having those conversations with your child if you're informed enough to know, which is why, you know, doing some research after your child comes out, it gives you some time to educate yourself around proper pronouns, what pronouns are, and knowing that you don't need to know what they are, ask, mm -hmm. you know? And then they will tell you what they are. Mm -hmm. um, and you can ask questions. Um, I say they are, you know, depending obviously on their age, they will give you the, 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 the answer that you might be looking for um, when appropriate. And what I mean by that is, you know, 
um, just making sure that we're being sensitive to their age and also their development and um, where they are at, right? Um, learning and educating ourselves that transitioning looks different for everyone. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's very unique. Um, why, you know, there's medical interventions, why it's important to see a doctor that specializes. It doesn't mean that, you know, your child is going to have top or bottom surgery or anything like that. It just means that there's a healthcare provider that is going to meet the needs of that child, that that child and that parent's going to feel comfortable in that setting with that provider who is welcoming. And really, that's all that means. Now, there's a whole bunch of other stuff that you'll get there when you're there and you can ask questions. Doesn't mean that that's the way you're gonna go. Um, and I talk to you like that because that's how I've had co meaningful conversations with a lot of parents, you know, who are really for the first time learning the difference or understanding that the difference between gender and sexuality are two different things and why we, you know, the medical, um, field is so important in the trans community. It's, you know, because if your son is a transgender male who identifies as male, he still needs to see a provider. As he gets older, he's going to need a breast exam. He's going to need a pap smear. And to feel firm and feel supportive in, at your medical provider, that is huge. So, you know, I just wanted to expand on that because it does look different for different communities. And how, how hard is it, uh, you know, we were talking earlier about the fact that you have offered yourself within the foster care system as somebody who is going to, who knows something about this, is, has the right kind of mental and, 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 and spiritual approach to this uh, to create the healthiest environment possible. Well, so how hard is it to find, you know, people within the medical establishment who offer the same kind of reassurance is, 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 you know, is, is that easy or hard? It's hard. I mean, we are, I would say in this area, we are lucky. There are some great providers, um, which is wonderful. But I think on the whole, uh, particularly if you're looking at, you know, beyond this area, it's very difficult to find pediatricians who are well versed, um, particularly with the trans, with issues um, that trans folks face. Um, we know one of the things that, you know, systems are hard in, um, in hospitals, like we are forever going into hospitals, even after you've changed legal names and uh, gender markers, we're still, we know you get those ID bracelets with the wrong name and the wrong ID. So it's not just medical providers. Um, it's the whole, you know, the whole medical system is not really caught up to, um, to what the issues that the, particularly the trans, but also the LGBTQ in general, Face. Um, and again, I think we're lucky in this area. There's lots of great providers that um, that we can look to. Um, but overall, I think it is difficult. Mm -hmm. And going back to something that Tracy shared earlier is this is why it's so important and key that you are your child's advocate. Mm -hmm. um, because like Tracy said, we do have wonderful providers in the Boston area. And we've been, I've been very blessed with that. But still, when I go to a walk-in clinic or I go to the hospital, I run into a lot of complications when it comes to, you know, how they, um, they um, adapt, right, to, to whatever you're telling them, um, though they're seeing something different. So when possible, which mm -hmm. I still do for all of my kids, is I call in advance. Um, I ask for a conference call with a doctor that is the first time they're going to meet my child. Um, I also do research on, you know, if you're looking for a new primary care doctor, are they LGBTQ friendly? Um, most websites and hospitals now have that and have people who actually specialize. Um, but it's, it's being your child's advocate and calling in advance and saying, hey, I understand that the insurance, especially, you know, with my children who come into foster care in the beginning, most of none of these things have ever been done for them. So it's all new. Um, so I call in advance and I remind that receptionist, make sure you grab a sticky note and write the preferred name um, so that when you call my child in the waiting room, you're using proper pronouns and um, proper name. Um, preferred name and um 
you know, that goes for a new school. That goes for everything where I am, you know, sending my child to. Um, I, as the parent, I have to be that advocate and do everything you can to t try to take some of that responsibility off their shoulder and do it for them. And, and find and identify who your allies are in those places right away, mm -hmm. right? So when you make a phone call, you can speak to that person again. Mm -hmm. um, I got to say a couple more things and, and then we'll be done. This has been a wonderful conversation, I have to say. Um, one, I have to say, I am delighted. Uh, I get to talk to a lot of people through the work that we do here at ACMI and have talked to lots and lots of people in the last three uh, to six weeks because everybody is home. Um, anybody watching can tell, uh, you know, the context under which we are conducting this interview, which is, of course, we are still uh, all of us in our homes and um, in dealing with uh, the pandemic as best we can. Um, what I was going to say is delighted to get 40 minutes into or however far into this conversation mm -hmm. we are without even bringing it up mm -hmm. first time. Um, but let me ask, is there anything that's specific to this time uh, that has made life either easier, which I doubt, or harder uh, for you, your families, and the LGBTQ plus community as you know it? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a difficult for, if you think about the wider LGBTQ community, um, some things that have been really um, difficult during this pandemic is there's kids or, um, you know, I guess particularly youth that are now forced to be home with maybe unsupportive um, caregivers, uh, kids who are only maybe be able to be out at school uh, who, who no longer have that opportunity. Uh, kids, uh, LGBTQ youth who have uh, support services, a lot of them are meeting online now, which is great. Um, so, but, but the loss of those supports. And I also really feel for um, whether youth or adults who have scheduled things like gender affirming surgery, who had them all postponed. And those sometimes are scheduled a year or more in advance. And so there's that huge uncertainty about whether um, those, when those will be rescheduled and all of those lead to you know increase in anxiety depression in an already very vulnerable population yeah it's interesting you know the I, whole idea of elective procedures um, right. you know they are elective procedures as far as the medical establishment's concerned they are hardly elective procedures i'm yeah. sure as far as a lot of the people awaiting them are concerned yeah, yeah. They, they are definitely not elective procedures, and that's something that's going to need to change over time, that realization that this is a gender-affirming surgery is a necessary medical intervention. Um, so, you know, I, again, my heart breaks for people who have been waiting, um, hanging on to get to those uh, and doing a lot to get to those, those surgeries only to now have them postponed. So those are just a few things. There's a, there's a whole laundry list of why this is difficult on many marginalized communities, but, but you know, the LGBTQ community for sure. Mm -hmm. um, so I've got one last question um, I wanted to ask you. Um, well, one last area, um, and that is um, our focus in this conversation has rightly been on the welfare of the children that we are talking about, both the children in your homes, your children, and others um, similarly situated. Understandably so. Um, I'm 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 curious though about the effect on you as parents, um, and specifically not just around um, needing to protect and, um, and support your child in different kinds of contexts and introducing him or her or them to different, um, you know, to, to different folks and institutions, et cetera. But how about for you? And by that, what I mean is how how, what are the difficult conversations or interactions you have to have with perhaps friends or neighbors or I don't know, other people uh, in the community? How, how does it go? You know, what, what are the things that you would say to parents um, just in dealing with their lives, <laughs> um, uh, you know, as parents of transgender youth? Um, well, I guess I'd say a couple of things. I'm sorry, Carmen, you go. I cut you off. No, it's okay. Go ahead. <laughs> um, 
you know, there's a, there's a couple of things. First of all, as I mentioned before, I think it's really important. You know, there's so many feelings that you have that are separate from your love and support for your child. So, you know, for some people, it is a uh, fear of what that means for your child. For some people, it is kind of a feeling of loss for not that you're losing your child, but you're losing kind of what you might have envisioned for them for the future. You're having to pivot what that looks like. Um, so it's really important for you to get support for yourself, again, whether it's um, support groups, therapists, friends. Um, so that's really important. But in terms of the, the conversations that you have, it really, you know, it depends. I have some, we've had some conversations that are quite easy and people are, you know, people, maybe they ask a few questions, but they're definitely, you know, on board. And then we have had some people that, um, you know, not so much. <laughs> and like, those folks don't really, get it, right? and they, don't they, get it. they don't get it. Or they ask, you know, really, um, you know, I'm sure Carmen, you will have this too. I, you know, I have some people that just ask like wildly inappropriate conversation, uh, inappropriate questions about, you know, what kind of surgeries my kids may or may not have, what things, you know, what, what under their clothes, what's under their clothes. I mean, just really, you know, bizarre and, um, inappropriate questions. Intrusive, so, you know, yeah, right, right. Very intrusive. And, um, you know, I get that people are curious and maybe it comes from a place of wanting to support, but um, very intrusive. So, you know, there are some, some conversations that are easy, some that are hard. And, you know, our bottom line was, you know, we would talk with, try to get everybody on board, but if people, they weren't on board, that was fine, but they weren't going to be on board with us. <laughs> and we were very fortunate that our, you know, our family for sure, um, you know, most of our friends were really very supportive after some, you know, you have to educate them, just like you educate yourself. So, you know, it depends on the person. Um, and the other, the other thing I would say for parents is really, there's no one way to do this. You know, I had a variety of ways that I would tell people, some people I would tell face to face, some people I wrote a letter, some people I wrote an email, some people I just put it in a Christmas card. <laughs> so, I, you know, I think to just to do what feels right for you and to know that there's just not one way to handle the situation. And Carmen? Yes, for sure. Um, I agree with everything um, Tracy said. Uh, I would also just say to parents, allow yourself to be to feel whatever that is. I mean, it's so important to acknowledge that this is not easy for parents. Um, not because we don't love our children, but because we do love them. Right. Um, because we want what's best for them. And it has nothing to do with who they are being wrong or not okay. It has to do with the fact that we live in a world that is not ready, obviously, right? Mm -hmm. And um, those are the fears and allow yourself to be, allow yourself to have emotions. It's okay to cry in the shower, you know, like <laughs> um, I still do it sometimes. Sometimes mm -hmm. I don't even know why, but that is, that is good. That is, you know, taking care of yourself and knowing where you are at times and knowing that this is not easy, but that your child is better because of you. Right. Um, and the other piece would be around having conversations with people. Um, don't feel that you owe anybody an explanation. You know, um, know that this is your child, your life, your home, and um, our jobs is to protect our children. And I've had to, in a very kind way, say, you know, I respect your point of view. I'm not comfortable having this conversation or I'm not having this conversation. Um, and, you know, some of those are harder than others because it can be with a grandparent, right? Or it could be with your church minister. I don't know, right? Um, so there's a lot of decisions that goes into this, but allow yourself to be, speak your truth, right? And um, know that you're doing the right thing. Follow your heart. Um, we've covered a lot of ground today and, and really powerfully. Um, uh, I very much appreciate you guys being here. I wanted to ask you as, as we wrap up, um, and just kind of issue an open invitation to you to share one more lesson learned, uh, some hint that you might have for others, something that we haven't mentioned 
uh, yet that you want to make sure is out there. Um, so in whichever order you'd like, um, if there's something to add, please, please feel welcome. Or not. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I guess, the, I mean, we've talked about a lot of what I would um, want parents to know, but I guess one thing just for parents or grandparents or whatever, just to, um, just to know and remember that, you know, your child is the same child that you loved and protected and cared about and all the things that you enjoyed about them is the same. I remember when my, my oldest child was talking, um, was wrote a letter to my mom um, when, when she came out to her and she said to her, Grammy, remember, you know, think about if you have a phone that you really love. It's a lot of great features. It has all your favorite photos on it. But then you just get a new case and it looks different, but it's still the same phone that you always loved. And I always remember that because it's true. They're the same, you know, you know this new fact about them, but that doesn't change this, what you know and love and appreciate about them um, from before they told you. And for me, what I would say is um, you're not alone, right? Um, you don't have to do this alone. Um, allow yourself to let people in your life who want to be there. Um, and there is community, right? Like I felt very alone in the beginning of our journey. Um, and you will lose people, but you will gain a lot of people. Great people that, you know, will be there through you to hold your hand, to cry with you, to celebrate. There's a lot of celebration in this as well. Um, so my biggest message would be is that there's, there, there is people out there, um, there is community, um, and there's always room. Um, and I welcome that. I welcome, um, I, I'm always open to have a conversation with parents and stuff like that. Cause I remember my first P flag meeting, walking in there and being scared and not knowing what to expect and thinking about it in the parking lot. Right. And if it's not a meeting, just reaching out to one person. Um, and, and we can do this together. Mm -hmm. um, and I just realized that I have something to throw in myself, which is um, a reminder to, to folks who've been, who, who've been watching um, that, I, and I'm just gonna assume you guys are gonna agree with me on this, that though we have been focused um, because of the specific experiences that you guys have on the T part of LGBTQ uh, today, on the trans, mm -hmm uh population um i am sure that all of the wisdom shared here today is equally applicable to other members of that community and people in other situations within that spectrum um so I, with that uh point of clarification um i want to thank you guys again um i've been talking to Codman paulino and to tracy mckay um, this has been uh, the ABCs of LGBTQ+. I'm James Milan. Thanks so much for joining us.